we talked about dating last time, how uh, dating was not something that uh, actually existed all that much uh, with you guys. It was more hanging out in groups and, and pairing off. Uh, who was your first crush? What was your first heartbreak? Hmm. Oh, there it is. I said I heard a story over there, Ben. I um, used to go to the CYO dances in Cambridge, and my girlfriend Jackie met a kid there at the St. Mary's dance, and. Um, I was like the wallflower. I wanted to become part of the curtains. So they introduced me to his friend. Oh crap, can't think of his name. Oh, Ronnie. Well, we start going out. Going out is, you know, talking on the phone. We're, I'm a senior in high school, but going out is talking on the phone and maybe going to a movie on Saturday night. Ronnie's school was having a winter dance in the beginning of January, and he invited me to come. And I said, that would be nice. So I got a new dress, and off we, um, off we go. When Ronnie showed up, his brother had driven him to my house to pick, uh, pick me up. He came in with a black sport jacket, black pants, black shoes, and white socks. <laughs> that was the undoing. <laughs> My father was a snappy dresser. He never wore white socks. So we go to the dance, and my friend Jacqueline fought all evening with her boyfriend, and she decided to leave, and I thought, oh, wow, this is awesome. I can go, too. And I left with her. I, I just felt like... She there was somebody else in the same dress, too. And she looked better in it. <laughs> so I was glad to go home. And I broke up with Ronnie very shortly after that. <laughs> well, a few weeks later, it was Easter. He said that year must have been the end of March. And the Saturday before Easter, I got roses. And the card from the yellow roses was one rose for every week with you. Love, Ronnie. Ronnie died a week later. It was some sort of a heart ailment. I always thought that he died of a broken heart. Oh, how I loved racing home from school every day to watch American Bandstand with Dick Clark. I couldn't wait to see all the regulars, Justine and Bob Corelli, Arlene DiPietro, Carmen. I knew them all by their name, like they were all my best friends. Then in 1958, Dick Clark featured a Saturday show. It was called Dick Clark's Beach Nut Show. It was a little different than the bandstand format. It was a stage presentation and all the uh, popular singers came on to perform, although they lip-synced. I've heard now that they lip-synced all their songs. <laughs> But they were all the famous people like Frankie Avalon and Dion and the Belmonts and Chubby Checkers and Bobby Darren and Neil Sedaka. And at the end of the show, Dick Clark would announce the top 10. There were 40 hits going on, but he would announce the top 10. So about this time, about 10 of my girlfriends and I, we formed a club. So on Saturdays, we'd watch the show and we'd practice our dancing. We'd eat pizza and snacks. And then we do the uh, mashed potatoes, the pony, the twist, the monkey, the jitterbug. And we had dues. I was the treasurer, so I got to collect 10 cents from everybody. That gave us a dollar. That was enough to buy the 45 RPM of the week. And then we'd meet once a month. We'd actually be allowed to invite a, a boy. This was kind of the first dating experience, I think, for all of us. Nobody else plays no. in the bottle. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
how old you were when oh. you had these groups, these, the two years that you had the... Yeah, early teenagers. How old? Early, early teens. That, but I, 13, but these, 14. the post office, you went in a, a closet, and I think you <laughs> could decide whether you wanted a stamp or, or um, a package or something. I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> 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 oh, boy. When I was about 15 and a half, my father got a job in Los Angeles. And my family had never been west of New Jersey, so this was a really big move for us. I was going to be a senior in high school that year, that coming year, but I was really unhappy with my life and where, where I was, so I was fine with moving to someplace new and different. People told my parents, to, if possible, to move into Beverly Hills because the school system was absolutely incredible, like being in a private school. Lots of rich people paying taxes and um, oil rigs right on the property. So we rented a small apartment on a very busy street in the slums of Beverly Hills. <laughs> Beverly High was really an amazing school. The teachers were terrific, the classes were small, and it was, it was really quite an awesome campus. There was a thing called the swim gym which uh, was a building that had a huge swimming pool in it. And it could be covered over with this floor that just sort of miraculously rolled out over the pool, and it became a basketball court. I got to take several electives because I had plenty of time in my schedule, so I decided I would take drama. The kid who sat right in front of me was Richard Dreyfus. He was Ricky back then. We did a scene together, I don't remember what it was, but I was sure he was going to be a really good stand-up comedian. He also played Peter in our production of The Diary of Anne Frank, and I was a dresser, which meant I got to run up and down the narrow staircase behind the set to help him with quick wardrobe changes in between scenes. Well. Ricky definitely did quite well for himself in Hollywood, and my claim to fame was that I got to dress him. <laughs> <laughs> the swim gym was the gymnasium at Beverly Hills High School. They decided to design it with a floor that opened up, and the swimming pool would be underneath the floor. They shot It's a Wonderful Life here, where there was a scene where uh, Jimmy Stewart's dancing with Donna Reed, and a couple of guys are jealous and they turn on the switch and the pool opens and of course they fall in it. But on April 20th, 1964, fans flocked to Queens to catch the New York Mets inside their new Shea Stadium. For over 40 years, the facility was a home run, hosting baseball, football, and even Pope John Paul II. And who can forget when screaming fans witnessed the Fab Four performing in the infield. It's August 1965, and the Beatles are coming to Shea Stadium. And I don't have a ticket. But that wasn't going to stop me from seeing John Lennon and the Beatles. I recruited the gutsiest girl in my neighborhood, Margaret. She just got things done. <laughs> and a few days later, we are on the train on our way to Shea Stadium, planning our strategy. We removed, okay, stole two of the advertisements that were posted inside the train. Rolled them up and stuck them under our arm. I said, everyone will think it says we love Ringo, or I love John, because that's what all the girls did back then. We really didn't have a plan. We were just taking it one moment at a time, and uh, it's quite wonderful, actually, that we lived in that moment and just trusted it will come to us, the solution. 
At any rate, we uh, arrived at the stadium, and I wasn't th we weren't there very long when a cop walked by and said, here, could you use this? And he handed me a ticket. I was like, oh, geez, we're halfway in. And I was only, you know, about five feet. Margaret was about five, six, and uh, pretty wild. You wouldn't uh, mess with Margaret. So I look kind of fragile in comparison. I gave my ticket to Margaret. We decided that clearly I looked like the victim out of the two of us. We did smoke. We went over to the, uh, uh, went over to the corner. Margaret lit up a cigarette and started blowing smoke into my eyes to make it look like I was crying, and my eyes here. And then the two of us very pathetically walked over to security and said, we were both holding our tickets, but somebody took Susan's ticket, and off they ran. What we didn't anticipate was that we were going to be escorted. <laughs> he, he said, we'll see about that. And he took us, you know, this back way and up an elevator in Shea Stadium to Margaret's seat. And of course, on the way up, I'm sure my mind was racing. Oh, geez, what's going to happen? But we just stayed in the moment. And then he asked me, hey, let me see your poster, you know? It was a toilet paper ad. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh no, I'm way too embarrassed. <laughs> At any rate, when we got up there, Margaret's seat was empty, of course. She had the ticket, and lo and behold, the seat right next to hers was empty. <laughs> you know, sometimes I wish I had half the moxie of that young girl. <laughs>